hopefully today get to the, uh, well, we, it probably won't happen because I want to go through Second Thessalonians 2 uh, and finish that. But um, so probably next Sunday will be the last lesson on Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. Won't that be a blessing? Well, there's method to my madness. You know, I know that this is a controversy that just, you know, won't, won't let go of the hearts and minds of God's people. And uh, it's a controversy that dates all the way back into the days of uh, the Apostle Paul. And the controversy is this. When does our gathering together unto him occur? Not in terms of a date that we might set, but in terms of prophetic chronology. What happens first, second, third, fourth, and so on. And we believe in a doctrine that's called the pre-tribulational rapture. By pre-tribulational, what we mean is it takes place before that period in prophetic history that is called the tribulation. Now, we call it that. The Bible doesn't actually call it that. The name of it biblically would be perhaps the 70th week of Daniel. That would probably be the most precise biblical definition or designation of this prophetic period. So what is it? Well, Daniel was given a prophecy. It's called the 70 weeks prophecy in Daniel chapter 9, beginning at verse 24. The 70 weeks prophecy covers the history that begins with the proclamation of Cyrus to Israel to return to their land after they had been cast out by Nebuchadnezzar. You follow what I'm saying? How many of you know, you never heard about Nebuchadnezzar, you don't even know who that is. So Nebu, for short, was used by God to bring judgment upon Judah and to cast them out of their land. And the prophecy was that 70 years after that, God would allow them to come back in. Well, Daniel reveals that at the beginning of that restoration, the beginning of that time in history when God would, would call his people to come back into their land, there would be 70 weeks during which all of the prophecies concerning Israel would be fulfilled. And it would run from that declaration or that decree from Cyrus that the people could return to the land all the way until the time that Israel finally acknowledges Messiah, her king, and anoints him, the anointing of the most holy. So that's the span of the prophecy. Now, Jesus came along, oh, about 500 and some change years later, and he told us that a key event in Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy was yet future. Now, that tells us that the 70 weeks prophecy was not 490 days seven day week, seven times, right? It wasn't 490 days. Why? Because 539 years later, well, actually, I think that probably was given something like 536 or something. But so 500 years and some change later, Jesus shows up and says, there's a, a key prophecy in Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy that has not yet been fulfilled. It's going to be fulfilled later in the time of the end. That tells us that from Jesus' point of view, and I think he's somewhat of an authority, he said, he taught us that that 70 weeks prophecy was not 490 days, but rather 490 years. Each day for a year. And when we studied Daniel together, we went into all the scriptures where that's established. The day for a year uh, language used for prophecy. So one day for a year. But still, Jesus came 536 years later. So, we're a little confused here. Well, this gets really interesting, but this is, uh, so hold on to your hats. But what happens, is the Bible teaches us that there are 360 days in a, what we call a divine year.
My iPad's talking to me? No, it's this thing. I'm sorry. Let me get this turned off. I usually try to remember that before I start teaching because, well, you saw why. That's why I do that. Okay. Yeah, it caught me. So you don't have to feel too embarrassed when it happens to you because it happens to me too. I forget to turn those things off. So 490 years, but there, th these years are 360-day years. Now, just a real quick way to know that this is the way God looks at a year. When you study the flood, you'll see that it, it indicates a five-month period there. And this, this period, when you calculate the numbers, because it says that it went in on this day and it came out on this day and you... And you do the math on that, you find out that these were 30-day months. Now, you can't take any five months in our calendar and have 150 days. It's going to be off. No matter what five months you pick. In a row. In a row. Yeah, if you take, right, if you take, that's right, if you pick them out that way, you could, you're right. But if you take any, any uh, consecutive set, of five months in our calendar, you'll never come up with 150 days. It varies. So what's going on here? Clearly, a biblical month is 30 days. A biblical year is 360 days. So what's wrong with God? I mean, he didn't notice that. That we have 365 and a quarter days? Let me ask you another question. In everything you know about God, and everything, if you've, you know, how deeply you've studied into science and the amazing precision uh, of numbers, the amazing precision of things like, well, the cell and the RNA and the DNA and the and the this and the, I mean, how, if you've ever looked into that, it's it's stunning at how complex and how orderly and evenly balanced everything is. The atom, right, has its nucleus, and then it has its proton, and its neutron, and everything just balances out, and it's all like, like perfect. It's, it's an amazing thing. So why would God create an orbit that wobbles? I mean, you would expect, I'm not, this isn't proof, this is just, you know, I'm just offering some observations. You would expect God, the creator, would have created an orbit and a system that was even, orderly, and symmetrical. Not weird and wobbling. Well, it just so happens, by the way, that all of the calendars before a convention called the Conopus, something or other, they, 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 uh, they gathered in Africa, all the priests did, they gathered and they studied this thing and they said, we're going to have to change the way we calculate our seasons and our calendars are going to have to be altered because of a fault in the heavens. It is, because before 700 B.C., everybody's calendar, everybody's calendar was 360 days of 12 30-day months. Everybody's calendar was. And in 700 BC, somewhere in there, these, uh, the, the calendars started having trouble. How many of you have heard about how cleverly the pagan were able to understand the alignment of stars? How many of you have heard that? How did they all miss 365 and a quarter day years in a solar cycle. How'd they miss that? How do you miss that? If you're watching the stars and you're paying attention to the new moons and everything, well, you don't miss that. Those guys were very careful in their observations of the stars. They built, they built pyramids that would allow a star alignment to shoot a ray of light through a little hole. That, I mean, I'm bigger than that, but you know what I mean? Yeah. These guys really understood how the system worked, and they were very, very careful observers of all that. So 
then they began having problems. So they started creating this, the civil and sacred calendars and having problems with their calendars. And then finally, in about 180 uh, BC, they got together and decided to just go ahead and establish a calendar that lined up with what they were able to observe in the, in the, in the heavens. So what would account for that? What would account for uh, if you went from a 360-day year to a 365.25-day year? What would account for a variable uh, orbit of the moon around the Earth? Where it's, well, I think it averages out to 28.8234, uh, some number like that. Some weird number. Uh, so, right? What would account for this? Well, if, as a matter of fact, the Earth was adjusted just, not even a degree, just a little bump farther from the sun, by the time it makes its full orbit, it would take longer to get around the sun than it used to. If the Earth shifted just a little tad away from the sun, just a little bit, that would increase its gravitational attraction over the moon. That's what it would do. So it would pull the moon in a tad. Right? So it would lengthen the year cycle, and it would shorten the lunar cycle just by a little bit. Well, is there an event in the Bible that we can point to that would account for that? Well, as a matter of fact, there is. And does that event happen at around the same time that everybody began having trouble with their calendars? Well, yes, as a matter of fact, it does. In about 700 B.C., anywhere from 700 to, to you know, 600, I mean, that, in, within that century, we know that Hezekiah was visited by the prophet Isaiah and told, make sure your will's written out and your your personal affairs are in order because you're going to die. Well, Hezekiah, the Bible says, turned his face to the wall and cried like a little baby. Like most of us probably would feel a little, a little emotional having just received news like that from the prophet. So he prayed. God told Isaiah to go back to Hezekiah. And tell Hezekiah, I'm going to extend your life by 15 years. So, and, and, and then they, uh, uh, he asked, he told Hezekiah, choose a sign whereby you'll know this prophecy is going to be fulfilled. Shall the Lord lengthen or shorten the shadow on the dial of Ahaz? Now, the dial of Ahaz in that era was like Greenwich Village with regard to time. It was like the gold standard of, of marking time. And you know how a, uh, a sundial works, right? You've got this circular thing that's marked off in increments. You've got a little, a little fin that stands up there, and as the sun hits it, the shadow moves around the dial. It's, it was their way of... I mean, it didn't... It, didn't, it wouldn't work as a wristwatch. And you wouldn't put it in your house anywhere. It had to be set in one specific place that was the standard for time in that day. Well, Hezekiah said, there's no big deal if the, if the uh, shadow goes forward. So let the shadow turn back. I believe he said 10 degrees. Let the shadow turn back 10 degrees. Now, if you start doing this all scientifically... <laughs> And you're looking at the whole situation. You understand the sun's here. Here's the earth. And there's little Ahaz sundial. And the sunlight's hitting that dial. It's casting a shadow. What event would cause that shadow to retract? It would be if the, if the sundial moved farther away. So if the sundial was shifted just a little bit away, it would pull that shadow back. Isn't that remarkable? So what happened is, at that time in history, and this is very interesting to everything we're talking about here, because what God did when he extended Hezekiah's life, that gave, that allowed for Manasseh to be born. 
Now, you might not understand who Manasseh is. He was the most wicked king that ever lived. He was worse than any of them. He was worse than Ahab. I mean, he was, there wasn't a king more wicked and more vile than Manasseh. However, it's also true that it allowed for another king to be born named Josiah, who was the best king that Judah ever had, and who was the uh, grandchild. You see, he had Manasseh, then you had um, Ammon, and then Josiah. So he was the grandchild of Manasseh, the great-grandchild of Hezekiah. Think about this. God hears Hezekiah crying and praying, and God makes a decision to extend his life, and when he did, that set in motion the events that would take us to Manasseh and then to Josiah and then to the Babylonian captivity. When God turned Judah over to Babylon for judgment, he pointed to the sins of Manasseh as the reason it happened. But when Josiah came along, the word of God was found. It was read to him. He was a young man. He repented, and, and God extended the life of Judah for the life of Josiah. But when Josiah died, it was over. Then Judah was turned over to Babylon. So you see how all this ties into our study, because that was a critical moment. It's almost as if God did a thing that basically threw the whole system all out of kilter. He was going to take the kingdom away from his own people, Israel, and give it to the Gentiles. And it's almost like that event that happened when he, when he allowed the sundial to retard back 10 degrees. It's like as if God say, is saying with the heavens, and the Bible teaches us that he speaks to us through his heavens. That with the heavens, God made the statement that everything just now went boom, out of order. And it won't get restored to order, really, ultimately, until Revelation 21, when there's a new heaven and a new earth. It's fascinating, isn't it? So, what we're looking at is now Daniel's prophecy, in which he said that after the Babylonian captivity, Cyrus would come along. And that's the first uh, Persian king of the Persian Empire that follows Babylon, that he would decree that the people would come back to the land. But Daniel gave a prophecy that it would be a 70-week prophecy before it would finally be fulfilled and the people would be returned and restored and the kingdom would be restored to, the, to God's people. But I've already said that, wait a minute here, we got... 70, we got 490 years. We've already established that it's years, not days. We've got 490 years here, but Jesus told us that the signature prophecy that occurs in that last week, the last of the 70 weeks, was still future. So let's look at that. Daniel said that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem to Messiah the Prince which is the coming of Jesus Christ into the world, would be a period of uh, 62 weeks and seven weeks. He goes, he says, seven weeks and three score and two weeks. How many of you, how many of you remember your Daniel Catechism? We've been through this quite a bit, but it's time to review it and get it set up as we get ready to go into Revelation now. He said, there, there shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. Why in the world wouldn't he just say three score and nine weeks? Why say seven weeks and three score and two weeks? What would be the point of doing that unless the prophecy would unfold in two phases? Phase one, seven weeks. Phase two, 62 weeks. That would be the reason to do that. And as a matter of fact, that's exactly how the prophecy plays out. The first segment of the prophecy, the seven weeks part of the prophecy, begins with the 
going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem to the place where the streets are built again and the walls in troublous times. That's what the prophecy says. That's in the language of the prophecy of Daniel 9. Well, we know that the going forth of the commandment to restore to build Jerusalem happened in 539 B.C. And we know that the second part, of the, the, the end of that first phase of the fulfillment of that prophecy, the seven weeks, is with Nehemiah. And I think it's 444 B.C. But the period of time from the going forth of the commandment, 539 to 444, is too many days to be seven weeks of years, or 49 years. It's like 52 years instead of 49 years, some, a couple of years missing. So, or 108 years. I'm forgetting the specific numbers. Do you forgive me for that? You're good. You're a good Christian. <laughs> so that period is uh, 49 years, but I think it comes out like 108 years from those two events. So you think, scratching your head, huh? So you, you start studying Carefully in the book of uh, Ezra, especially, you find out that the children of Israel started rebuilding the temple and occupying the land. And then two years later, they stopped. And then a certain number of years later, when Darius came on the throne, they started again. And they continued and then stopped. And if you, interestingly, if you add the years during which Israel was in obedience and actually occupying the land and building the temple. It comes to exactly 49 years. I know it's just fascinating. And I stumbled on that quite by accident. I was doing a biblical chronology. And I have to believe the only reason God had me doing that is because he intended to bring this to my attention in the course of that study. But in, I'll tell you why. Because when I finished my first run through the chronology, I found another guy Floyd Jones, who did a much better job than I did. And so when I got done with mine, I read his, and I said, did I waste all that time? <laughs> and just buy his books, and I got it. And there was a lot of work involved in this. But I must say that in the course of that study, I stumbled on this. I noticed, as I was trying to figure it out, calculating the years. Well, this many years... They did it and stopped, and then they started again this many years later, and I was just doing chronology. Then all of a sudden it occurred to me, I thought, wait a minute. The years that they were doing what they should be doing add up to 49. And I had already studied Daniel enough to know that, wait a minute, I got that 49 years there. Oh, and I began putting the pieces together, and then it all laid out beautifully. So that's the whole principle of starting and stopping the prophetic clock, so to speak, is established right there. And then you have an unbroken run of 62 weeks that brings us to the time that Jesus Christ manifests. And here's another interesting thing about Daniel's prophecy. Daniel 9, he says that there are 69 weeks until Messiah the Prince. And then it says, after that, he shall be cut off. So, you know, after means, well, you know, after. So you have 69 weeks, it stops, and then there are some things that happen between the 69th and the 70th week, and it's right there in the prophecy. It's not an invention, it's in the prophecy. Because after three score and two weeks, Messiah shall be cut off. Again, after means after. And so you have to have three score and two weeks completed, and then a question mark in terms of how much time elapses from there to the event Messiah is cut off. So we have from the time, the going forth of the commandment to the time Messiah shows up, 69 weeks. After that, Messiah gets cut off, but we're not told exactly when. And then there's one week remaining, the 70th week. That's the week we usually call the tribulation. And when Jesus showed up 536 years later, which is so much fun to show you the calculations that, that reveal that Daniel prophesied virtually to the year of Jesus' birth. Perfectly. 
It's amazing. So Jesus Christ shows up and he tells us that the abomination of desolation, which is the signature event of that last week, that 70th week, in the middle of the week, we're told that the prince that shall come will cause the oblation and the sacrifice to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he'll make it desolate. And elsewhere in Daniel, he refers to the, the abomination of desolation. And the abomination or the uh, transgression of desolation. And Jesus combined them and called it the abomination of desolation. So anyway, so Jesus talks about that event, which, is, which marks the middle of that 70th week. Is that in the midst of the week, he'll cause the oblation and the sacrifice to cease and for the overspreading of abominations, he'll make it desolate. And that's the event we call the abomination of desolation. And that marks the middle of that week. Well, Jesus said that event was yet future. And that tells us that that period of, of lapse between the end of the 69 weeks and the beginning of the 70th week includes... Messiah being cut off, of course, rising again from the dead, sending the Holy Spirit, his church doing its work, all the history you and I are living right now, all that. And then that 70th week is yet future fulfillment. And, and we're told how it begins. It begins with the confirmation of the covenant, which Isaiah 28 tells us is the covenant with death and hell. Okay. Now, here's where it segues or it kind of well, better. A better word would say here's where it intersects with our study of Revelation. Because. Daniel said that the, the, uh, that there would be a covenant. That would start the 70th week. Many people believe the covenant that starts the 70th week is none other than the restoration of God's covenant with Israel. But that can't be true for about 735 reasons. But we, we won't have time to go over them. I, I'm teasing. I just made that number up. It, but there are a whole list of reasons that that doesn't work. But I can tell you where in the Bible we read about a covenant that, that is a prophecy. Isaiah 28:15. And it's the covenant that Israel, the scornful rulers of Jerusalem, make with the Antichrist. Isaiah 28. They enter into a, a covenant with death and they come into agreement with hell. Now here's where that connects with, with Revelation. And where all of this connects to Revelation. Because the book of Revelation tells us about the four horsemen of the apocalypse. How many of y'all ever heard of that? Okay. The first horse is the white horse with a rider without a, with a bow and no arrows. The second horse is a red horse. And then you have a black horse and then what we call the pale horse. The prophecy of Daniel describes the rise of Little Horn to power as developing in four stages. It begins when he's talking peace and he's destroying many with peace. And then it goes to a uh, where he's killing people. He initiates war. And then he has power over all the resources of the earth. And then he goes into a, a full-blown persecution against the saints where he's just killing everybody he can kill. Well, those four horsemen follow the same pattern. The white horse is indicative, and everybody agrees with this, of a person that's using peace to gain political power. Once he gains political power with this, these overtures of peace, I... I speculate here, but he gets the sword in order to enforce the peace. So now he's given a great sword 
And the Bible says in Revelation, the second horse rider takes peace from the earth. So now he's got political power and military power. The next thing he gets is economic power. The black horse is usually thought to refer to famine, but that's not, that doesn't really embrace what the third horse is really about. It's price control. The third horse gets to say how much bread's going to cost. And he gets to set economic policy, don't hurt the oil or the wine. The black horse holds scales in his hands. And he measures out and he controls the economy. So he has military control or power. He has uh, military, when I say military, he has political power, military dominance, economic dominance. The fourth horse is often misunderstood to be disease. Well, pestilence is certainly involved. It is interesting. The way things are shaping up right now, it's easy to see how people like Gates and company can use a disease to control the world. So there's clearly, and it is named in the fourth horse, but everything else is named too. The fourth horse rider, if you read it carefully, and we will be looking at it very carefully in a, some few weeks to come, he actually uses his political might, his military might, and his control of the economy to set forward now a massive killing machine where he kills one-fourth of the population of the planet. Yeah, a fourth of what is it now? Is it almost seven billion on the planet now? So what's a fourth of that? Billions of people are going to be killed during this time. Well, that fourth horse rider in Revelation is called death with hell following. Isaiah 28 says the scornful rulers of the Jews enter into a covenant with death and in agreement with hell. This fourth horse rider is the Assyrian that's prophesied in, in Isaiah's prophecies and elsewhere who is, uh, who is perpetrating upon the earth what the Bible prophesies is the overflowing scourge. Well, the Bible says in Isaiah 28 that the rulers of the Jews see the overflowing scourge come upon the earth. And they reach out to this guy and they enter into an agreement with him. That begins the 70th week. Yes, sir. Does this horse rider have control of social media? <laughs> you bet he does. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Amen. <laughs> that's what because that's what counts. Well, look at today how much control that gives the bad people to be able to control the public square, to control speech. I'll touch on that in the message this morning. But uh, yeah, so you follow all this, man. You just learned. Uh, you, each of you deserve the PhD in prophecy. Now <laughs> you got more information on prophecy in that little spiel than. And most people know, quite frankly, which is too bad. So, amen. So we come to that 70th week then. It begins with that fourth horse rider. And then you have the seven trumpets that sound. And interestingly, each of the seven trumpets is a partial or restrained judgment. One third of the trees of the earth are burnt up. One third of the ocean turns to blood in the sea and, the, and one third of the creatures die. One third of the sun is smitten. One third, it's always one third. What's the point of that? Revelation 12 tells us that when Satan fell from heaven, his tail dragged with him one third of the angels. And as we said, God speaks through the heavens. And he's making a statement. His judgment is coming. 
you have picked the wrong God. <laughs> you made a big mistake. You better repent. These trumpet judgments are warnings. They're measured judgments, only one third. And they are a call to repentance. We know that for a lot of reasons. Here's one of them. The sixth trumpet. At the end of the sixth trumpet judgment, God declares by the Spirit through the Apostle John, and nobody repented. Nobody repented. That's when the seventh trumpet sounds and says, there shall be time no longer. Now, that didn't mean time disappears as a concept or as a measurement. We know that because a thousand years takes place after this. So we know he didn't mean that time disappears. What did he mean? He meant time's up on this world system. All that's left now is the judgment to fall. And that's what calls up the seven bowls of God's wrath. The seven vials. The seven vials, the Bible says, in them is filled up the wrath of God. This is the full wrath of God. And interestingly, as the bowls are poured out and the wrath falls upon the earth, it's not one-third, one-third. It's all. All the green grass is gone. All the fish of the sea are dead. All of the oceans and all the waters turn to blood. It's very interesting. This is the full release of the wrath of God. It concludes with, it almost, if you're reading it, seems a little anticlimactical, but it really isn't. It's actually perfect and almost poetic. It concludes with that prophesied judgment whereby God will wipe the lie from the earth. It's the hailstones. Isaiah prophesies that these, these, these hailstones will be God's Besom. Now, there's a word we don't use a lot. It's not an alteration of the word bosom. Besom means broom. God uses his broom, his heavenly broom is the outpouring of his wrath in the seventh vial of these, I think they're 50 pound hailstones that fall from the heavens onto the earth. I've seen pictures of what a hailstone about that big can do to a, the hood of a car. Just cave it in. You have a 50 pound hailstone. It's just gonna smash buildings and smash, I mean just flatten things. It's just gonna be amazing. But what's interesting and poetic about it is that that's God's final Judgment, it's his broom. He comes in behind all the mess that's made by the first uh, six vials. Oh, we're talking about plagues, people chewing their tongues off. And I mean, it's just, it's really, yeah, it's, whew, what happens? It's just amazing. All the green grass is gone. All the trees are gone. All the fish of the sea go belly up dead. The whole sea and all rivers and every water turns to blood. I mean, it's just, it's horrendous. That's why I say when you read those things, and then you come to this one and hailstones come out, you almost feel like you, that's, the, that's the grand finale. But what it is, it's clean up. It's when God breaks out his broom and says, okay, we're going to clean this up now. He sweeps it all away with the hail that falls down. So it's, it's, it's actually just like God, you know, to... To do stuff that way. Does the hail, uh, come with fire? Yes, you're right. Yes, hail with fire and brimstone. It's a cleanup, brother. Amen. So he does a cleanup, and then we uh, are then we move on to the return of Christ to the earth, and we come with him, and all that kind of good stuff follows. And we have the thousand year period of time during which Satan is bound in the bottomless pit. At the end of that thousand years, we call it the thousand year reign of Christ. That's actually a misnomer. Christ began his reign when he took Satan and booted him out of the earth. He's reigning now. He continues to reign and it never ends. When he comes back with that kingdom and sets it all up on the earth, the reason that there's a thousand year period 
it's marked by not the duration of Christ's reign. It's marked by the, the duration of Satan's banishment in the, in the bottomless pit. It starts when God takes Satan and binds him in the bottomless pit. Revelation chapter 20. Read it and pay attention. You're going to go, oh, that is what it says. That's what's going to happen. I guarantee you. Those of you who've heard thousand year reign of Christ over and over and over, who have thought for years and years and years, oh, the, the millennium, that's the thousand year reign of Christ. You just heard me say, no, his, his reign never ends. Never ends. And it began a long time ago. <laughs> so what that thousand years about is about is about this. Satan is bound in the bottomless pit for 1,000 years. It begins when he's thrown into the bottomless pit and it ends when he is released. When he's released, the Bible says he has a little season. We, we can't be real precise on how long that is. But he's released for a little season. During that time, he goes about his work of deceiving all the nations again. And the nations come up against Jerusalem. They mass all around Jerusalem in rebellion. And the father says, I'm done with you. Jesus doesn't even fight a battle. Jesus leads us in the battle of Armageddon, but it's very interesting that in that scenario, Jesus doesn't fight a battle there. The father steps in. He hurls the earth in a flaming fire out across the heavens and it melts in fervent heat. All the heavens disappear. The dead are all gathered in front of God upon his throne. And you have the great white throne judgment. Revelation 20, 15, or 11 to 15. After that judgment, that entire crowd is cast into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet have already been and where now also Satan goes. So Satan now is taken and cast into the lake of fire and all of the damned are gathered before God and a great white throne and all the dead and he judges them According to, his, according to their works, and he casts them all into the lake of fire that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And then he makes a new heaven and a new earth. A new heaven and a new earth. And we get to live in what's called the heavenly Jerusalem. That's our house. And the earth will be, I'm, I'm, I'm running out of time here, but we got a lot to go over. Okay? So, if it is. So we will be going over all the stuff I just, I just gave you kind of an overview, whoo, you know, the big picture kind of thing. Now we're going to come back and fill in all the details and lay it all out as we go through the book of Revelation. And uh, we trust that we'll be able to begin that next week. But I do want to take one more run at the uh, doctrine of the rapture because, because all of you are begging me for it. <laughs> but because it's a doctrine that really does need to get established as we move forward. Let's stand together, please. We'll pray.